This week, we dive into Ancient and Modern Initiation by Max Heindel as we read the final chapter in Part 1, Chapter 6, The New Moon and Initiation. According to this chapter, what is the key to success, and when are you closest to God? Then, we'll hear an all-new Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. You've heard the stories about various people who have reportedly died but continued living like Elvis and others. But what if I told you brother Davy Crockett survived the Alamo? Brother Harrison gives us the scoop. Then we'll talk about making decisions the Masonic way. How do the cardinal virtues direct us when making tough choices? How do they direct us when making simple choices? All this and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back. This is episode number 483. As you heard in the opening, we've got a great show off the bat. As always, I want to thank our producers, our fellows, our contributors, and of course, our legacy partners. If you want to know how to support this show, Go to WCYpodcast.com, click on support the show, and see how you can support us. We've been doing this show for uh, 10 years, just about, just shy of 10 years, and we can't do it without you. Your money goes to paying for our web services, for hosting the podcast, making sure that all episodes are available all the time, that we don't have an exclusive member section or anything to access the content. Nothing against podcasts who do that, but in this particular podcast, in this venture, uh, we want to spread the light of masonry as liberally as possible without limiting access. So because of these contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners, we are spreading the light of Freemasonry all over the world, and masonry is finding the people who need it in their lives. And for that, I am immensely and forever thankful to these individuals for assisting us. I want to take a moment just to push the new book we released. Uh, I did release a book earlier, a couple a month or two ago, called How to Charter a Lodge, a No-Nonsense, Unsanctioned Guide. And you can get that from wcypodcast.com, autographed, or you can get it on Amazon and Kindle as well. Links to those are directly on our website if you'd like to check that out. I want to mention that it is not always just about how to charter a lodge in the book. It also has plans and ideas, and if you're thinking about how to amend your bylaws to rejuvenate your lodge or to get back on track, things like that are also contained in the book. Secondly, I want to thank everybody out there who has been picking up the latest book that we just released, The Master's Word, a short treatise on the word, the light, and the self. This is, again, autographed book. However, This is not a work of myself or John Ruark. It is a work of a man named George Plumer who wrote this book, and it is intensely amazing. If you want to get a copy of this book, as I mentioned before, an original copy, if you can find it for less than $500, you should definitely buy it. If you want a cheap reproduction facsimile copy, that's fine too. I have one, but it is again a facsimile reprint copy. That means it's just been cut to pieces and people copied the pages with a copy machine and then bound it together. Everything is in there and it is somewhat difficult to read. It's not laid out well. Because we love the work so much, John and I decided to retype set the whole book add footnotes and annotations, and add additional content in the form of a couple new essays that are in the book uh, that talk about the book, what it contains, its value, and the man who wrote it. So if that interests you, you can pick that up also on the website or also available on Amazon and Kindle. Announcements. By the time you're listening to this, I will have already presented at Scottish Rite a virtual day of light for the Valley of Philadelphia. But you will have a chance, possibly, to catch a presentation I'll be doing on March 4th, 2021, which relates to the books I've written with John, It's Business Time, and as well as the book I wrote called How to Charter a Lodge. Both of these are more adapting successful corporate business practices into Freemasonry as well as the ins and outs of chartering a lodge. So if that interests you, I'll be doing it for Bloomington Lodge number 43 in Illinois via Zoom. Information will be posted to our website soon. And uh, last but not least, announcement for this week is Masonicon Ezekiel Bates 
yeah, it's still planned. It's going to happen regardless. We just don't know if it's going to be a limited in-person attendance or not. So uh, keep your ears and eyes peeled for more information about that. That'll be happening on May 1st. I'll be out there along with my wife, and uh, we're going to have a great time. And I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing some fellowship, albeit socially distanced and masked up with my brothers in Massachusetts. So we took a, a little break from our reading of Ancient and Modern Initiation by Max Hindle or Heindel, however you'd like to pronounce that. We are going to get back to it this week with Chapter 6 in just a moment, but I did want to let you know also that next week's show, I'm going to have another special guest. We're going to talk to Brother Joe Martinez about a listener-requested topic, and that topic was Fallen Angels, Aliens, and Freemasonry. What do those things have in common? Well, very loosely, very quickly, it goes a little something like this. Whether the fallen angels were fallen angels, or they were ancient aliens, or it's an archetype to tell us what happened, or the it gives us the allegory of a concept of how the human consciousness has evolved. Whichever you subscribe to, or maybe a totally different one, Brother Joe Martinez and I talk about that, its relation to Freemasonry, the proliferation of mystery teachings throughout the ages and how that relates back to these kind of ideas of ancient teachers, how that goes into Freemasonry, and we even talk about the professionalism as it comes to being intellectually honest with different interpretations and translations of different languages. Notably, in our conversation, we talked about Greek. And I learned a whole lot. So I'm really looking forward to bringing this episode to you next week. And I think you'll really enjoy it. But for now, let's get into the education and the reading of Chapter 6, Max Heindel's Ancient and Modern Initiation. Chapter 6, The New Moon and Initiation. When the candidate entered at the eastern gate of the temple, looking for light, He was confronted by the fire on the altar of burnt offerings, which emitted a dim light enveloped in clouds of smoke. He was then in the spiritually darkened condition of the ordinary man. He lacked the light within, and therefore it was necessary to give him the light without. But when he has arrived at the point when he is ready to have evolved the luminous soul body in the service of humanity, then he is thought to have the light within himself. The light that lighteth every man. Unless he has that, he cannot enter the dark room of the temple. What takes place secretly in the temple is shown openly in the heavens. As the moon gathers light from the sun during her passage from the new to the full, so the man who treads the path of holiness by use of his golden opportunities in the east room of selfless service gathers the materials wherewith to make his luminous wedding garment and that material is best amalgamated on the night of the full moon. But conversely, as the moon gradually dissipates the accumulated light and draws nearer the sun in order to make a fresh start upon a new cycle at the time of the new moon, so also, according to the law of analogy, those who have gathered their treasures and laid them up in heaven by service are at a certain time of the month closer to the source of their maker, their father fire in the higher spheres than at any other time. As the great saviors of mankind are born at the winter solstice on the longest and darkest night of the year, so also the process of initiation, which helps bring to birth in the invisible world, one of the lesser saviors, the invisible helper, is most easily accomplished on the longest and darkest night of the month. That is to say, on the night of the new moon when the lunar orb is in the westernmost part of the heavens. All occult development begins with the vital body, and the keynote of that vehicle is repetition. To get the best out of any subject, repetition is necessary. In order to understand the final consummation to which all this has been leading up, let us take a final look from another angle at the three kinds of fire within the temple. Near the eastern gate was the altar of burnt offerings. On that altar, smoke was continually generated by the bodies of the sacrifices, and the pillar of smoke was seen far and wide by the multitude who were instructed in the inner mysteries of life. The flame, the light, hidden in this cloud of smoke was at best but dimly perceived. This showed 
that the great majority of mankind are taught principally by the immutable laws of nature, which exact from them a sacrifice whether they know it or not, as the flame of purification was then fed by the more coarsely constructed and baser bodies of animal sacrifices, exacted under the Mosaic law, so also, today, the baser and more passionate mass of humanity is being brought into subjugation by fear of punishment, by the law in the present world, more than by apprehension of what might follow in the world to come. A light of a different nature shone in the East Room of the Tabernacle. Instead of drawing its nourishment from the sinful and passionate flesh of the animal sacrifices, it was fed by olive oil procured from the chaste plant kingdom, and its flame was not shrouded in smoke but was clear and distinct, so that it might illuminate the room and guide the priests, who were the servants of the temple, in their ministrations. The priests were endeavoring to work in harmony with the divine plan, therefore they saw the light more clearly than the uninstructed and careless multitude. Today also the mystic light shines for all who are endeavoring to really serve at the shrine of self-sacrifice, particularly for the pledged pupils of a mystery school, such as the Rosicrucian Order. They are walking in a light not seen by the multitude, and if they are really serving, they have the true guidance of the elder brothers of humanity, who are always ready to help them at the difficult points on the path. But the most sacred fire of all was the Shekinah glory in the west room of the tabernacle above the mercy seat. As this west room was dark, we understand that it was an invisible fire, a light from another world. Now mark this, the fire that was shrouded in smoke and flame upon the altar of burnt offerings, consuming the sacrifices brought there in expiation of sins committed under the law, was the symbol of Jehovah the lawgiver, and we remember that the law was given to bring us to Christ. The clear and beautiful light, which shone in the hall of service, the east room of the tabernacle, is the golden-hued Christ light, which guides those who endeavor to follow in his steps upon the path of self-forgetting service. As the Christ said, I go to my father, when he was about to be crucified, so also the servant of the cross, who has made the most of his opportunities in the visible world, is allowed to enter the glory of his father fire, the invisible Shekinah glory. He ceases then to see through the dark glass of the body and beholds his father face to face in the invisible realm of nature. The church steeple is very broad at the bottom, but gradually it narrows more and more until at the top it is just a point with a cross above it. So it is with the path of holiness. At the beginning, there are many things which we may permit ourselves, but as we advance, one after another of these digressions must be done away with, and we must devote ourselves more and more exclusively to the service of holiness. At last, there comes a point where this path is as sharp as a razor's edge, and we can then only grasp at the cross. But when we have attained that point, when we can climb this narrowest of all paths, then we are fitted to follow Christ into the beyond and serve there as we have served here. Thus this ancient symbol shadowed forth the trial and triumph of the faithful servant, and though it has been superseded by other and greater symbols holding forth a higher ideal and a greater promise, the basic principles embodied in it today as ever. In the altar of burnt offerings, we see clearly the nauseating nature of sin and the necessity of expiation and justification. By the molten sea, we are still taught that we must live the stainless life, that of holiness and consecration. From the East Room, we learn today how to make diligent use of our opportunities to grow the golden grain of selfless service and make that living bread which feeds the soul, the Christ within. And when we have ascended the steps of justification, consecration, and self-abnegation, we reach the West Room, which is the threshold of liberation. Over it we are conducted into greater realms, where great soul unfoldment may be accomplished. But through this ancient temple stands no longer upon the plains, where the wandering host pitched their camps in the hoary past. It may be made a much more potent factor for soul growth by any aspirant of today that it was by the ancient Israelites provided he will build it according to pattern, 
nor need the lack of gold wherewith to build distress anyone. For now the true tabernacle must be built in heaven, and heaven is with you. To build well and true according to the rules of the ancient craft of mystic masonry, the aspirant must learn first to build within himself the altar with its sacrifices. Then he must watch and pray while patiently waiting for the divine fire to consume the offering. Then he must bathe himself with the tears of contrition till he has washed away the stains of sin. Meanwhile, he must keep the lamp of divine guidance filled that he may perceive how, when, and where to serve. He must work hard to have abundance of bread of show, and the incense of aspiration and prayer must be ever in his heart and on the lips of the Yom Kippur, the great day of atonement, will surely find him ready to go to his father and learn how better to help his younger brothers to ascent the path. That concludes chapter 6 and part 1 of Ancient and Modern Initiation. We're going to skip the reading for next week, but the week after we will continue with part 2, chapter 1, The Annunciation and Immaculate Conception. Right now, let's get into this week's Masonic Minute with the incomparable Stephen L. Harrison. The list is a mile long. Jimmy Hoffa, Princess Diane, Jim Morrison, D.B. Cooper, Amelia Earhart, Adolf Hitler, Michael Jackson, Tupac, Anastasia, I could go on and on. And don't forget the granddaddy of them all, Elvis. Who are these people? All of them have been reported to be alive after their deaths. We might even add William Morgan to that list. Killed or not, there were enough Morgans sighted out there after 1826 to populate a small town. And there was that guy in my neck of the woods, Jesse James. So many people claimed to be Jesse after he died that in 1994, archaeologists came to little old Kearney, Missouri and dug him up. You know who was in that grave? Jesse James. Well, this finally brings us to the Masonic connection to all this. Brother Davy Crockett, is it possible that the king of the wild frontier did not die at the Alamo? Be careful, you skeptics, and consider this. There were many Freemasons on both sides at the Battle of the Alamo. Most notably on the Mexican side was General Santa Ana himself. Legend has it that he avoided execution after the Battle of San Jacinto by giving the grand hailing sign of distress when taken to Sam Houston. Houston himself, a Freemason, was then said to have spared the general's life. One way or another, there is no doubt that Santa Ana escaped with his life. So if Santa Ana could do it, why not Davy Crockett? And there are, in fact, reports that he gave the grand hailing sign and was spared. Old newspaper articles exist which claim Crockett survived. One in particular from an April 1836 edition of the Cincinnati Whig reports, Colonel Crockett not yet dead. With that, the paper said it was, quote, much gratified in being able to inform readers that Colonel Crockett, the hero and patriot, is not yet dead. This cheering news is brought by a gentleman now in this city from Texas." End quote. The article goes on to give details of Crockett's wounds and medical treatment. It says he received a severe blow from a tomahawk and was shot in his left arm and one of his thighs. It also reports he was doing well. The main theory about what followed the Alamo says Brother Crockett eventually went to Winston County, Alabama. 
There, in 1859, a land grant was issued to a man named David Crockett. The document itself is signed by both David Crockett and President James Buchanan. The story begs the question as to why Crockett would survive the Alamo, not return home, and more or less keep it a secret that he was alive. Jason Scott, who now owns the land, speculates Crockett had fought Andrew Jackson, president at the time of the Alamo, over the Indian Removal Act, which is true. And for some reason, Crockett wanted to stay low, using the Alamo as the perfect cover for his death, then resurfacing at the age of 73, 14 years after Jackson died. The story clearly leaves a few gaps, which Scott explains away by claiming Crockett just wanted to be left alone and go hunting. Scott also claims Crockett was buried on the property, that bones were discovered, scientifically confirmed to be human, and then returned to their resting place. Ground-penetrating radar on the property has turned up nothing. In effect, the evidence Crockett survived the Alamo is scant. It becomes more questionable when comparing the signature on the land grant to known Crockett signatures. It does not take a handwriting expert to quickly see they are not the same. On the other hand, there are several eyewitnesses from the Alamo who gave an account of Crockett's death or identified his body after the battle. Among the most notable of these is that of Susanna Dickinson, the wife of one of the Texans killed, who said she saw Crockett's body along with what she called his peculiar cap outside the chapel. Francisco Antonio Ruiz, mayor of San Antonio, whom Santa Ana ordered to identify bodies, corroborated her story. Other reports differ, saying Crockett was captured and executed. So the debate over the years from legitimate historians has not been whether Davy Crockett died at the Alamo, but how he died. It is a virtual certainty that he did not survive, and it may not be as important how he died as the fact that, of his own volition, he stayed and fought for what he believed in. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right, it's confession time. I'm Davy Crockett. That's right. You know, sometime after the Alamo, I did indeed move and I went to the property mentioned by Brother Steve, except I was bitten by a vampire and I ceased to age and I've just been laying low ever since. And now I've returned back to the fraternity in the form of bringing you this podcast. (laughs) Honestly, this was a really fun Masonic Minute. I had never heard this theory before, but it's up there with the likes of things like Oak Island and some of the other mysteries. I thought for sure that this kind of fits up there with one of the famous conspiracies that perhaps John Wilkes Booth did not die by any account that we have on record. One of my favorite books, Manhunt, is a phenomenal read. I cannot recommend that enough as an aside. But after reading Manhunt, I... I now believe Wilkes Booth, it's likely that he did die, probably on the front porch of the building on the property, which was where he was cornered. But in terms of Davy Crockett, this was just wild, but almost believable, right? Like so much has been told about you that you're this king of the wild frontier, right? That's the song we have today. Maybe he did just retire in secret. Who knows? What are the odds? Nevertheless, we want to thank illustrious Brother Harrison for bringing this work to us totally amazing. If you like this, head on over to wcypodcast.com. Click on the bookstore. There I have links to various books which are by people who have been on the show, by myself, personal recommended reading lists, and also recommended reading from other people who have been on the show. And I have up all of Steve Harrison's books. You can buy them through Amazon. They're on Kindle on some of them. But tales like this 
you can find in Tales from the Craft, an amazing book that I really love and has made me think about the fraternity a whole lot differently much of the time. So again, thanks to Illustrious Brother Harrison, and make sure you check out the videos that Illustrious Brother Harrison puts out uh, because we do put those up on our YouTube channel. So if you don't get those notifications, head on over to youtube.com, find the Whence Came You channel, click subscribe, like the videos, and uh, even enable notifications so that you get those when it comes out because a lot of you do not find the notifications on Facebook or whatever reason. Uh, that is another way that you can make sure you're on the forefront of the information as it comes out. The other piece for this week is something that I wrote called Making Choices a thought experiment. Now, this is not so much of a mandate that you do something, but uh, asking what if we did something. Making Choices, a thought experiment by Midnight Freemason contributor Robert H. Johnson. People make choices countless times a day. Well, not exactly countless. What if I told you that the average human makes around 35,000 semi-conscious decisions each day? Not bad for not being a machined computer. These decisions, for the most part, are simple. Notice I said semi-conscious. The majority of these choices are very passive and are based on experiences that have embedded visualized outcomes within their subconscious mind. It's like a computer's random access memory, or RAM. Frequent things that your mind uses all the time are stored in a way that makes them easily accessible. This makes making the decision easy. In our day-to-day -day lives, while just moving through our day, how many times would you say you stop and think about the outcome of a choice you're about to make? Perhaps the big decisions, sure, you think about them, but those everyday choices, the ones that don't seem so big, the ones that add up and have outcomes that seem to be just a part of daily living. Are we giving those decisions the thought and foresight we would when making other decisions? When we think about the big decisions, we often think about how those outcomes will impact our lives first. And if we're extra mindful, we take the extra step, thinking about how those choices impact our friends and family. It's kind of like chess. In chess, you're always thinking about the next move. The best players think about the next several moves and the outcomes. I love chess but I'm terrible at it. What makes choices easy? When we think about whatever choice we're going to make, we immediately process the previous occasions we made similar choices. Our brains determine the probability that things will go the way they did previously. This gives us comfort in the decision. Hey, this is just like last time. I'll make the same decision and the outcome will be the same. A warm fuzzy blanket. Emotional complacency is born. Rather than think about each choice we make and deal with the emotional and sometimes headache-inducing internal debate, we develop an easy road. Scratch that, a lazy road. The lazy road allows us to develop an unwillingness to rationalize scenarios and outcomes and instead always rely on similar situations we've experienced ourselves or within our peer circles. Not every choice needs this deep dive, but some of them we may benefit from taking the time to calculate the outcomes. I should water my plant. Well, maybe not. I didn't water it yesterday and it's fine. Well, we all know where this leads. Get up and water that plant. Oh, an extra tablespoon of sugar in my coffee today. Well, I am supposed to watch my sugar intake. Nah, just one tablespoon today. These are small decisions, but they have a measurable impact when we think about them and their long-term or cumulative effect. Well, what does Freemasonry say about making choices? Well, it gives us a few virtues that give us some good insight. Fortitude allows us to stick to our guns once we've made a choice. In the classical sense, justice will enable us to weigh in on an outcome's equity, selfishness versus selflessness. Temperance allows us to remain moderate in our decisions, but prudence, Prudence is what we're talking about here. Prudence is deliberation. It means to take into account all possible perceived outcomes of a situation and make your choice based on the aim of the person making the decision. So, do you want to affect the most people? The least people? The questions are innumerable. My charge to you is to attempt to bring prudence back into your life by taking small pauses when you recognize that you're about to make a decision. Think about the outcomes. 
Maybe you do the thing you always do. Put two tablespoons of sugar in. Maybe you change your mind. Maybe just one. Remember, not everything needs a panic-inducing brain cloud. Just be mindful and try this out when you can. Now, my two questions for you this week for our Craftsman Plus and anybody else who would like to reflect and uh, share is number one, going back to ancient and modern initiation. In that last chapter, Max Heindel talks about building the temple within yourself and building an altar with which to sacrifice things on it. Now, in Freemasonry, the direct correlation could be the common gavel, which strikes and removes the imperfections of the stone or removes the vices and superfluities of life. What are some of the habits that masonry has helped you break? What are those things that you've put on that altar and sacrificed in order to become better? Your second question is, give us an example of a decision that you frequently take for granted or a decision that you have frequently taken for granted but finally decided to really think about the outcome and it changed you. That's it for this week. I want to thank once again, the producers, fellows, contributors, legacy partners, you guys make it all happen. If you want to find out how to assist us in bringing Masonic education to the world over, please head on over to WCYpodcast.com, click on support the show, and see how you can help support it. Thanks to anybody out there who is buying the books that I've been putting out. I really appreciate that as well. I look forward to seeing you online on Zoom meetings or anything else where we're gathering and having a good time. And maybe I'll see you at Masonic Con at Ezekiel Bates up in Massachusetts on May 1st. I'm hoping I'll see you anyway. And also upcoming, maybe I'll see you at the Midwest Conference of Masonic Education. What is that? You should totally Google that and then uh, get back to us a little later on. But I want to thank you all. Until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.